I'm Ben, the part of Kara RDH that you have never heard of. Now get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast Gygenist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienist. This is Andrew. I am going solo today, no Michelle. Michelle is out sick. She has been sounding like death all week and it's really kind of, I mean, I think it's funny. She doesn't probably think it's funny. I wanted her to do it anyway, but it's it's probably better that she didn't. And she's doing the whole, let's travel across the country 8,000 different times in a week and she's just, you know, Michelle. So I'm flying solo and as you guys know, I'm going to keep it really short because that's what I do. But... I do want to encourage you all to visit the Facebook page, shoot us emails, write us an iTunes review, um, all of those things that'll help us get the word out there about the podcast. We really appreciate those things. So before I get to the episode, I wanted to read one little listener feedback that we got. Um, I'm not going to use his name because he is a guy, Genesis, and there's not very many of us out there in the world, but he said, um, let's call him Franklin. Franklin's a solid name obviously not his name. Um, but he's been listening for a little while. He's uh, a pretty recent graduate. And so he said, hello, Andrew, I have a compensation question. And this question is very fitting for today's episode, which is all about restorative hygiene. So he says, um, I work in an office that pays me hourly, but I also get a bonus if I meet my goal of over $1,200 a day. I've noticed a trend where with hygiene only numbers with fluorides and, um, SRPs, profies, all that kind of stuff. I am barely ever making it to or past the bonus. I usually hang out about the $500 to $800 range, depending on the schedule, but I also do restorative as well. Um, but, the restore, but the restorations I do don't get calculated into my production. I do about 5 to 15 fillings per day, also depending on the day and the schedule, because in between those restorative patients, I'm seeing hygiene patients as well. So he asks, is it common for an office to not incorporate a percentage of the fillings placed by the RDH towards their production? If it is uncommon, in your opinion, what is a good percentage for compensation per filling? Uh, thank you as always. Stay blessed. Franklin, even though it's not his name. So um, I want to reach out to you, the listeners. If you guys have any advice on that, I sent him my thoughts. Probably not the best. I told him, I said, so let's look at a doctor. I told him that when doctors are paid on production, Everything is built into the production with exception sometimes of the exams and the x-rays. Sometimes the hygiene side of things aren't calculated into the doctor's production, depending on where the, the doctor's working at and what, how they have it all figured out. Uh, so I told him that, you know, it stands to reason that, <clears throat> you know, for some things they could exclude like maybe the, uh, usually it's not, usually it's not fluoride or sealants. Those are usually add-ons. So those, those are getting to production, but maybe it's the, perio charting or maybe it's the x-rays because sometimes the assistant takes the x-rays or something like that so sometimes those are i can understand if those ones get excluded from the production goals but i've never heard of a case that the, that the actual restorations were excluded um and i guess that goes back to documenting and charting like how how are they tracking your production if it if it's not in your chair is there the report that they run can you put your provider number or whatever your identification marker is in there for them to be able to track it. Um, and so I, you know, my thing is I think that he should get um, the fillings need to be definitely discussed and, and factored into the production. But I also don't feel like doing the restorations and getting paid a percentage of the restorations that he places are necessarily equitable for the company because what will end up happening is they'll say, well, we don't want to pay him, ten dollars per filling he puts in or, or whatever it ends up being and so we're not going to utilize him in that capacity any longer now his production goals are going to suffer even more and he's going to be sitting on his hands all day and so that's obviously not something anyone wants so what i told him and again listeners set me straight because this isn't something I've, i feel like i'm an expert in at all um i said you know if twelve hundred dollars is going to be your bonus and you're doing five to fifteen fillings each day 
you have to assume that each filling is probably around $250. Now this is not, this is average Washington, what I've seen kind of filling cost. I know that there it's more expensive in some areas, depending on the surfaces and a lot less expensive in other areas of the country. So just, just, this is just my assumption that on average it's 250 each. I, I told him that he should maybe suggest to his, his bosses that the production floor should go from 1200 to 2500. So that'd be 1200 that he normally has to do for his hygiene patients. And if he's doing five fillings at 250, which is about what 1250, something like that, 2450 is going to be the, the 1200 plus the 1250 that'll include the filling. So that, that should be his new goal. Um, and if he goes above and beyond that, then he should get his bonus. The only thing that the information I don't have is how much is the bonus? Is it a flat? Okay. If you hit your bonus and you get hundred dollars or is it, you hit your bonus and then you get a percentage of everything above and beyond. I don't know any of that information, but if you, if you like what I had to say about that, let me know if you hated it a lot, eh, maybe let me know that too. But any information that you can get for Franklin, that would be great. Okay. So now for this episode, this episode is really pretty cool. Um, it's, I think it's the first time that I feel like I've really discussed restorative hygiene and kind of how it works. This episode was kind of a, a, a takeover, a mom genus takeover. So Jasmine and Christy did us a favor and they interviewed both Mike, who's my brother and myself who both do restorative dentist restorative hygiene. Um, and so it was kind of a, a, a a turn of the tables. Jasmine and Christy did a fantastic job of asking really pertinent, really cool questions. Um, it gets kind of interesting at the end because we talk about dental therapists and my views on the dental therapist thing. And yes, and send me all the hate mail you want. You, some of you guys are really going to not like what I had to say about that. So, but uh, I don't think that my position was articulated well enough on that. Bottom line, dental therapists are important and something that we need. But listen to the episode to see what else I had to say about it. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So welcome. This is Jasmine. This is Christy. And this is a mom genus takeover. We've already taken over RDH under one roof, and now we're taking over a Tale of Two Hygienists podcast. We are so excited to be interviewing on their platform. Woody woo. Woo woo woo. woo. <laughs> <laughs> we're bringing some flavor from the East Coast. <laughs> New York. Some. And Massachusetts, Boston. That's right. Some. By way of Maryland. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. I need to turn it down a notch. <laughs> <laughs> we're super excited, but we're, yeah. we're going to be interviewing um, Andrew and his brother Mike. And uh, we want to talk about a very special topic that I feel like is going to elevate that thinking for hygienists on the possibilities that we can have in our profession. It's all about seeing how amazing uh, dental hygiene is. It's not a job, it's a career. So, welcome to A Tale of Two Hygienists, Andrew and Mike. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm so <laughs> honored that you guys asked me to be here on this podcast. <laughs> um, my name is Andrew Johnston. I'm a dental hygienist from Washington State. I am a restorative hygienist, as is my brother Michael. And that is me. I'm Mike Johnston. I live in Olympia, Washington, so about an hour and a half from Andrew. Okay. Uh, and I also practice uh, restorative hygiene. Uh, I'm amazing, amazing. They are so serious right now. I'm, so I'm trying to do my best I'm, for this I'm podcast. Really, I'm really, I know, really nervous. I think I've heard this podcast maybe once before, and I know how straight laced everyone is on this one. So <laughs> exactly. just trying to keep it, to keep it good. <laughs> Can I say though, honestly, this has been a great conference so far, right? Yeah, honestly, it, it, I, my first time. Good. I'm so glad. My first, this time, first time too. Chris and I've actually met in yeah. person, right? Yeah. So, oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We talked a lot, you know. Yeah. Facebook Messenger and the phone and stuff, but yeah. it's first time face to face. So, yeah, that's crazy. I know. It's been a year Ooh. since you and I met. This is our anniversary, isn't it? It wasn't it under one roof that we met for the first yes. time last year. Happy anniversary, Jasmine! It's oh. our anniversary. I don't know that song. <laughs> <laughs> what I'll pretend to sing. <laughs> So yeah, wow. this has been great. And this is yeah. So and then Mike, this is his first time mm-hmm. to under one roof. So that is awesome. I'm loving you, it. Are you going to come to Maryland? 
next year. Yes, that's the plan. Good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Get him to say yes. I don't. I don't like the. That's the plan. Get him to say yes on the podcast. All right. That all way, right. when he doesn't come, everyone can shame him. Commit him. Mike Johnston. <laughs> She's gonna commit. Will you? Are, will you come to Maryland? And rock it out with us at RDH on the one roof. Well, I'm glad you were more specific because I was going to say yes. Because of his son. Now he said rock it out. He's like, I don't don't know about the rock it out part. (laughs) He's about that life. He's about that life. That's right. (laughs) Rocking it out. Okay. So why we're having this interview today because we want to talk about restorative dental hygiene. I'm on the East Coast, and I've been in academia, and um, what we focus on is just clinical preventive care. We did learn how to place restorations. Right. But uh, we don't use it. That's mm. it. And so when we, when we hear restorative hygiene and the fact that you are actually using, I remember listening to your episodes and hearing about how you have these uh, composite instruments and mm. you're on a whole nother, I don't know, just a whole nother level when it, become, when it comes to dental hygiene. So we want to talk about restorative hygiene and what exactly that is. So do you learn to place uh, fillings amalgam. in or amalgams in school, but you have not practiced it clinically at all. Then yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. there's now, no board exam to test for that. No. Well, that was going to be my question. Therefore, is, the licensure doesn't. Okay. Go now, are you are you allowed to in your state place them if you had the licensure to do it? Um, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. I don't mm-hmm. think it's in. When I'm thinking about like what we can do in the state Maybe of Maryland, a temporary filling is the only level. We, yes, of a we filling could do a temporary. That we could do. Yes. Yeah. But not. I mean, that's so crazy because we, we learned how to. We learned how to. Yeah. Yeah. We learned to place it. We carved out the anatomy. Um, we did a wax tooth, of course, before we did the amalgam. Mm. And it's. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. We don't utilize that at all. Nope. Interesting. So I want to talk a little bit about your education. Sure. Obviously, you still you. Um, Can we talk a little bit more about what a restorative hygienist is first? Is okay, okay, yeah. Just okay. because I feel like you know you guys understand because we've talked before, but yeah. there might be some people that are still in school that are like, oh, what what's going on? So yeah. Um, in our state and also the state of Oregon, since I have my license there, um, it's just a little bit. Uh, and and the, our model might be a little bit different than what a restorative hygienist is in, say, Minnesota, where, you know, the advanced therapists and stuff like that. Those are different. Those are not what we're talking about today at all. We're strictly talking about hygienists who have the ability and um, are licensed to place fillings in the mouth of a patient after the dentist is already prepped. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're talking about specifically. Agreed. Yeah, that's a good clarification because mm-hmm. I been, I I immediately start to think advanced dental yeah. hygiene practitioner, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So. And I think that you know, and then taking a step further, in some states you can only place amalgams. Mm-hmm. Um, in some states you can only place amalgams, and then class one or class five restorations. So going back to wow. the GB black thing, yes. class ones are occlusals, class yes. fives are buckles. Mm-hmm. Um, along the facials, cervical margin. Along the cervical mm-hmm. margin. I think we were talking to somebody the other day, and they made that statement, like, you can place a class two restoration. And I was just like, um, yeah, we can place everything. And they're like, whoa, class two, that's really cool. I'm like, it is. So cool. let's go over the classes because <laughs> a lot of people I'm don't really remember. terrible about remembering all the different classes. But so you have your class ones or your uh, your occlusals. occlusals. Mm-hmm. You have your class twos, which are going to be your interproximals, mm-hmm. posteriors is what they are. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So which is another th- interesting thing to talk about because there are places where you can only place class ones, class twos, and class fives. Right. But you can't do any anterior. So now when you so ones, twos, and fives posterior, you have your threes and your fours are going to be anterior now. Class three is going to be, Mike, you have to help me out. It's like the distal linguals, kind of like a class two, but for like the anterior. Mm-hmm. And then class anterior. four is going to be including it's in the sizal edge, edge and mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. So... Um, the, and we can maybe we'll go into that a little bit more about like how, why are those so different of you know why do you have to have classifications but um, just you why heard, are they have doing you heard that of a to class us? Six? What is a class six? Uh, in cu- in cu- cuspal inclusion? I think it's like a like cuspal that? inclusion, yeah. And I, Could I, be. I've only heard of it or some like from certain doctors will call it that, but most of them are just like, it's just a buildup. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I I mean, we could, yeah. There's, And I think that, you know, you even think back to even these classifications are coming from GV Black. Like mm-hmm. GV Black, if you guys all remember, like he was a super um, 
aggressive dentist. And so even talking about like his prepping technique and stuff is something that dentists don't use right. anymore. So some of these things, while we while they're still used, I mean, they might be even a little bit outdated and they might need a little bit of an updating on certain things. But mm-hmm. anyway, mm-hmm. so those are the classes, class mm-hmm. ones through five and possibly six. All right. So let's talk about education. Because I'm interested on how is the curriculum different. We have national Mm. accreditation standards that we have to abide by. And just going through accreditation process as an educator, I, you know, that's a whole, I'm not even sure where would they even place that? Is that in your clinic course? Like how is that restorative added into your into how you're formally trained as a dental hygienist. So Andrew, Andrew will probably remember a whole lot better. <laughs> well, than, I was going to say, I'm glad Mike's will. here because, <laughs> but to, to quickly before Mike answers that, you have to understand we don't come from an educator standpoint. So the terms and the words that we might use, we might not be able to address that, that specific question okay. because we don't understand about accreditation. I've never had to go through it myself. Okay. I don't know what CODA is looking for necessarily, what has to be included in uh, course, topic, study, you know, whatever the outlines, whatever goes into that. I've yes. never had to do that. Okay. So I might not be able to do that, but we can talk about starting from. Yeah, it was like dental materials one. was like quarter one. And so. To answer your question as best as I can, we didn't necessarily have – I mean, we, all, all of our stuff was put together. Sometimes it was – we were working on, like, the perio stuff. Sometimes we were working on restorative stuff. And sometimes we were working on anesthesia stuff. And so it wasn't necessarily separated into, you know, the first year you're going to do, you know, uh, biology-type t- stuff. And then your second year you're all going to do clinical stuff. It was kind of just like we went to school and we had a different class every day. Sometimes it was on, you know, restorative work. Sometimes it was on the next thing. And so, and, and to be clear about the biology part, those are all prereqs. Right. Uh, right. And, and a lot, I know a lot of people do, but I know there's also a lot of schools that include that in the dental hygiene That's program. That's true. Yeah. So, and so, like, our first quarter was just, like, dental materials. We got to look at them and play with them. And, um, you know, a lot of people that were, like, assistants previous to coming in had some really good experience with it. And then people like Andrew and I were kind of like... The first day on the job, we're like, what the heck is this stuff? And Why are the different colors? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Why doesn't that look like a what's, tooth? <laughs> what's the difference between a liner and a baser? <laughs> <laughs> Mike and I have a lot of little inside jokes like liners and basers because like, we're like, a base? What's a base? It's a baser. What's a liner and a baser? <laughs> oh, um, my gosh. They were ridiculous. And you guys were in together? Yeah, we were in the same class and everything. Oh, and my so gosh. School together, that is so cool. Stayed up late studying together and all that stuff. So it was... It was good. And I, and I remember, uh, okay, I know we haven't been out that long, but it's like eight years ago, nine years ago. It's hard to remember. Um, but I remember also that one of the first quarters, we did the same way you were talking about, Jasmine, where we did the wax. Okay. And so I remember trying to figure out how to carve into the wax. And yeah. like it never was like good enough, it felt like. And then we um, had a whole curriculum just on amalgam. Like, okay, like yeah. We, we stuck to like amalgam. We learned all the amalgam instruments. So like all the didactic stuff was something that we so it was a little bit more intense well. than what we are what we're getting which is like the little bit of a an overview just well, a bit I'm, of an overview I'm sure it's yeah quite a bit more intense I so mean, do you so you you had requirements for restorative um yeah a lot of that was like the, the, in the, school? the second year um, with with live patients with live patients so, so we, live patients was second year but we did have requirements for placements you know, like number a, 19 DO, yeah. and we had tests all along on dentiforms or typodonts, yes. as people call them. And we had to pass those clinically before we could work on patients. Right. Yeah. And it was, you know, they were mounted to the chairs, and we had to use, you know, the same ergonomics I don't normally use, have to use indirect vision, and all that stuff. Still. So by your second year, these advanced techniques that you're learning, you're implementing it in your clinic. Correct. And how do you find your patients? Because I know to find regular profi and perio patients was like, oh. I think it's very similar to like just how you find a patient in the real world. Somebody walks in and if they need treatment, then okay. it's like, okay, you, you need a class two. Okay, well, I, I'm still short on my class two requirements. So, you know, they found them, they did the, the perio portion of it, and then they'd send them over to me to do that. Or, you know, if it was like a, a class five, oh, Andrew needs a class five, then, you know, the so patient it's will qualify. It's similar. Yeah. yeah, it's Got exactly you. the same. It's the same thing. And, you know, the school has their avenue or whatever, and we still have a dentist that's at the school. We still have to, um, what do they call it, interpretation of radiography or something, whatever. But for our x-rays, we had to be able to interpret them, and then the dentist would sign off on them. If we found a lesion in approximately, then we would address it and say, hey, they need a filling of this tour. And then not really treatment plans. We're not allowed a treatment plan, but suggest a treatment plan. The doctor would actually write the treatment plan. So. 
those are still the patients that we'd be seeing for our profies or um, right. Got it. whatever. Same anyway, patient. So, so you were at a four-year university. We were at nope. a two-year. Two year. So you actually, so how many that dentists was there intense. to prep? So, so that you can one. place. We had one dentist. What we did is we had, uh, we had rotation. 18 students, too, if that clarifies. Okay. I, mean, so some, I know it's not, it's not like a 40 student. Yeah. That thing. still sounds like a lot. And I don't remember the exact number, but we had specific restorative days. So we Correct. were on a rotation. So, like, I would know months in advance, like, this is going to be my restorative day, okay. which would be different than Andrew's restorative day. Mm-hmm. And so he would do four to six. Four to six of them or something I like can't that. remember exactly. So he, he'd have four to six patients to prep. But we did all the anesthesia ahead of time and with our instructors and everything. Can we so give a shout out to Dr. MC Cola? MC Cola. <laughs> so he was the coolest guy. Uh-huh. We're like, hey, you MC Cola over here. <laughs> he had no idea we said that about him. <laughs> He'll know now. I, I doubt it. <laughs> were you his favorite? Were you his favorite student? I, I was nobody's favorite student. <laughs> How about you, Mike? Um, he was a pretty good student. Yeah, I was a pretty good student. I think probably my restorative instructor really liked me. And then Aww. Dr. Bueller, uh, he, he liked yeah. me pretty good. He liked you a little better than me. <laughs> um, yeah. Were well, you guys was, in the same nicer. clinic session? Yeah. Oh, I mean, wow. everyone was in the same clinic session always. Yeah. Um, wow. But what would happen is like four or six of us would be just doing restorative while everyone mm-hmm. else would be seeing other patients. And okay. stuff. So we would still have bodies in the chair. Yeah. Um, but you know, we'd just be doing different procedures or whatever. All right, so let's let's fast forward to graduation. You, you're graduating. You've completed your requirements. Mm-hmm. You're taking your national boards. Mm-hmm. What else, in addition, do you need in order to be a restorative dental hygienist? So in our state, um, and we actually just expanded this this last year, you do need a regional um, testing agency to have a restorative exam. So it used to be Reb for many, 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 many years. Mm-hmm. And I think even Washington State had their own before that. Um, and now we just accepted credits. Credits came out with the, um, and I'm really sorry, credits, uh, auxiliary restorative exam or something like that. And it was mostly for advanced health therapists. And mm-hmm. it was based off of those things that they had to do anyway. Mm-hmm. And we've adopted that into our state with whatever stipulations that we have. And... Um, so now you take either one of those two boards for a restorative. And then, like Mike was mentioning, anesthesia. You take one a board for anesthesia as well. Hmm. Written. Both. Written yeah, and, and national. Wow. And we have a national written board. Right. That's theirs. And yeah, the national one. And then we have your hygiene so board exam four. as well. And then our jurisprudence one as well. Yes. Oh, yes. So, oh. so I think there's... All in, yeah, five or six somewhere in there. Well, the anesthesia is two different ones. It's a yes, written, it's written anesthesia clinical. and a oh. clinical anesthesia. Yeah. So we have in our in our state on the East Coast, um, we have the CDC exam, which is a clinical. There's a written portion for that, and then um, um, <laughs> you guys are not seeing behind the scenes right now. <laughs> no, we're not saying anything. So we have the CDC clinical written exam. We have the um, jurisprudence for the state that we're in, the national board exam. We also have a nitrous board, and we have the local anesthesia board, and those are both written. The clinical portion um, is accepted in our state as long as you have the clinical hours. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So there's no there's no confidence. Like once you've passed your competency within your curriculum or have mm-hmm. taken a CE class mm-hmm. with those certain amount of um, hours, you're mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. So I find that very interesting. You don't have to renew the nitrous or the local anesthesia. It is that's set once you Just have it. Done, yeah. 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 yeah, same for us. We, I mean, we had our annual renewal, but yeah, it's like we don't have to does. renew the different parts of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, as a matter of pride, I'm actually very proud of our state for having it being so rigorous. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people with. Now, you know, especially military families trying to move in since we have a, a base there. And mm-hmm. I know it is hard. We do have like a um, a limited license that you can get yes. that's not a restorative. You can have one and still work in the state, but you can't do restorative at all. Uh, so um, I can move there. You could. Okay. Um, <laughs> Should you know? I mean, it's Washington. No, of, course, no, of, course, sure. of course you want the mom genus there. Of course we do. <laughs> and, and actually, you know, as another kind of side thought, we want everyone to move to Vancouver. That's cool, like you guys. That way we can just, like, have, like, everybody the, in one spot. The mecca of, of <laughs> dental hygiene all right there. That's right. We're about to Vancouver. take over the yeah. world. I'm ready for yeah. a change. <laughs> so I'm the ready. last thing I wanted to say about, uh, like, uh, curriculum stuff is we did have a 
set amount of requirement um, of, t- of services that we had to accomplish mm-hmm. yeah. um, prior to like each quarter. I think it was like 20. I think it was like 40 for the whole um, the whole program. But then mm-hmm. it was very specific into you had to have X amount of class ones or X mm-hmm. amount of class twos. Just like your perio qualifications yeah. that you had to have as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, the funny thing, I always talk about this too, even to some of the, the newer assistants that I work with that are kind of like, oh, hygienists can do restorative. Like even you still get that now. And it's like yeah. I tell them stories about how one of our first jobs out of school was in a, a pedo requirement or pedo practice. And um, I think in one morning we would work four hours and then we had lunch break and then have four additional hours. And I think in one morning Andrew and I added up the amount of services we did just individually and we did more in those four hours than we did the whole time we were in school. Wow. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's just how efficient you can become once you've started a practice. But it's just, it, it, this, when you start looking at numbers, it's kind of mind boggling. Yeah. I was thinking, so do you have that same anxiety as, say, East Coast hygienists who are graduating and they're like in the real world? three hours for a profi and then you're like okay now you have 45 minutes and you're like "Ah." do you have that anxiety Uh, i I did (laughs) i don't i mean i think where mike and i worked right out of school was probably the best place anyone could have started their career and you guys have heard you guys listeners so you guys have heard this before um i think everyone should do fast-paced corporate dentistry rigorous mm-hmm. they're going to hate their lives they're going right. to question their decisions to be hygienists they need to do that now that wasn't necessarily as bad of you know for us but i i'm strongly for you getting up to speed as quick as you can right. and having people be kind of tough on you because mm-hmm. i think that's what made mike and i really great at what we do is because not only was it about speed but it was about like is it pretty? Right. Uh, you know, because you can do functional dentistry, but if it doesn't look good, it ain't looking and good. those dentists, I mean, they were like, this is their name on it. They were picky. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they don't check our work after we're done normally, but they have. For a while, they did. And yeah. they had said, hey, get better, get better, get better, get better. So whatever anxiety we had was pretty much pushed out of us mm-hmm. pretty darn quick. Yeah. Um, and of course, now it's like, you know, Mike and I feel pretty confident that, you know, we, we can run a schedule and right. we can tell, and not that we would ever tell a dentist what to do, but, um, <laughs> we would say, doctor, I need to go prep here. I'm going to fill here. Doctor, you need to over here do an exam and do this, do this, do this to help facilitate that schedule because mm-hmm. we can do all, you know, as much as we can for them to help them. And we just need them to kind of realize that. Yeah, so I think I think that it makes things a lot more successful when the doctor's on board with that too. Because mm-hmm. you get some doctors, um, you know, when you're just having really good communication and the day is just like a dream. It is like the best day ever. And time goes by fast. You're busy. Everybody's happy. Everybody's getting along. But, you know, when that communication breaks up a little bit, then that's when you start getting the issues mm-hmm. and everything. So... So um, when you go out and you're interviewing for a job like that, they are particularly looking for restorative hygienists. I would say not necessarily. Everyone in the state of Washington to have a license, a full license, has to pass the rep. You can't have a full license without it. And so everyone is technically capable and able to do those fillings. So it's not necessarily a – what's the word I'm looking for? Like a – an it's add not on. Like a special position. It's, yeah, it's just. So your pay, it. everyone has the same base yep. pay. Yep. So go back a little bit. You said everyone has to pass the rep. The rep or rep. The, or credits, whatever the regional based agency exam. is. So do all hygiene programs offer that? Yep. I mean, is that In so? Washington. Every single Washington State one does. So every hygienist who goes through that curriculum must go through that. Must go through that. Do some not choose? Do some choose not to? People don't have a choice. That's, and no, a, that's the testing. And, that's the and, testing for that that area. Okay. Like everyone that goes. So CDCA is East Coast, uh, different states, and then that's right. the testing entity. I guess so I that was, everyone it's trained there. And, should, and so the states, the programs at the states are know that that's what the test is. Right. And so they give you the curriculum, but the state doesn't, or the schools don't have an option to opt out of it. I see. And then the students don't have an, gotcha. an option to opt out. Everyone has to just do that. So you have to pass. Does that mean the dentist will automatically allow you to be a restorative hygienist? No. Okay. No. I got you now. We, yeah. uh, we were very fortunate with our first job um, in that they put a lot of trust and 
and and really it was for efficiency and That's it was smart a, on them. It was I a mean, Medicaid clinic. I mean, they, yeah. they're getting paid pennies on the dollars for doing really high quality work. And I know that's not everywhere, but this particular one was really high quality. I really liked it. Um, which is actually, I think, is saying something because I did not leave that place on good terms. <laughs> I think <laughs> I'm, I'm very good about burning my bridges, apparently, and I, <laughs> I freaked that one out in flames. Uh, but but I, I will always say that they did some of the best work. Um, and still to this day, the, the hygienists that were putting out fillings there, way better than most doctors I've ever seen. Hmm. I even, I'll even make comments like when the doctors do an exam in my mouth and I'm like, hey, how are those amalgams looking in the back? And they're like, oh, these are some really nice amalgams. I was like, yep, yeah, those were put in by a hygienist. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm not afraid to boast a little bit because, they, like I said, it was it was high quality work. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the biggest things, um, the challenges, like going into a different office or when you're trying to do restorative is, is building that trust with mm-hmm. the doctor and, and teaching them that really we do know what we're doing. It's, I mean, it's, it is difficult to, to build that up. It yeah. takes, takes a while. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the things I had written down to actually talk to you because I, I feel that, you know, Dennis, when we were um, pushing to have local anesthesia in Maryland, they were like, oh, you're, you're not adequately trained. And we actually get more hours than they're getting right. when they're in dental school. So it would be, I was going to ask you, which I'm sure the answer is already yes, do they feel that hygienists aren't adequately trained? When a lot of times we are getting so many more hours to make sure that we don't make any mistake or cause right. any issues with our pr- profession. Right. I think, uh, yes, it's dentist dependent. I think a lot of the out-of-staters that come in and then mm. maybe they didn't uh, go to UW or maybe they weren't West Coast dentist mm-hmm. and they come over and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't want that. In mm-hmm. fact, on uh, I used to be on this dental collaboration committee with the state, which was where um, there was a, the hygienist group and then the dentist group tried to collaborate on different things and discuss things. And one of the things that we were working on was a local anesthesia um, general supervision for local anesthesia Mm -hmm. and there was one particular dentist who i have a lot of respect for but he wasn't from that area and he he had his hygienist put in some of the best feelings i've ever seen so i looked at some of her work and it was amazing but he was still different mindset with local anesthesia even Mm -hmm. and so you're gonna you know transfer that over to fillings i don't want to say a monkey could do it but it's there really is I mean there's an art to it for sure there, it's very mm-hmm. there's an artistic side and there's a mechanical side and if you can't master both of those yeah you shouldn't be putting fillings in um, but I feel like some of the dentists um, don't don't give the opportunity for the hygienist to prove themselves in a non pressure non stress induced environment mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would agree and it, like I said, it, like Andrew said, it, I mean, it really depends on the doctor. Like I just transferred into an office, and he's worked with uh, hygienists before, uh, who's who's done restorative. And one of the things is, is where he came from is the dentist would actually have to come back and check the filling uh, to make sure. But in the state of Washington, you don't have to do that. Um, and uh, for efficiency's sake, I just asked him one day. I was like, "Hey, you know, these sometimes these patients wait up to like ten minutes after I'm done." And he's just like, "Yeah, I've, you know, your, your fillings are, you know, you do them really quickly and they look really great." And I said, "Well, why do you come back?" And he's like, "I don't know. Do I need to?" And I'm like, "No. If I mean, if you have that trust, why come back?" And so even like for the patient's sake, you know, um, sometimes efficiency wise, it's it's just best when you have that trust. Trust just, is huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for your pay, you said it's hourly. Yeah. There's no commission base Correct. if no. you're restorative. So I mean, there's typical- probably some models that are doing that. For us particularly, we don't, and we've never been in that model. But there has to be some, right? There's got to be someone that's, it's, not, it's, not com- it's production-based. I mean, there's, there are people that. I don't know if I've ever heard any restorative hygiene that are production-based. I know, like, traditional. Yeah, I don't know. I, mean, mm-hmm. I tried to. Yeah, well, help cool. us wrap our mind around it, okay? Because typically we're used to either 30, 45 minutes, 60 minute appointments. Mm-hmm. You see a patient come in for three, four, six month recare, um, non surgical periodontal therapy. What is a typical day like for a restorative hygienist or a week like for a restorative hygienist? Well, there's two models, and I'll, I'll let Mike speak to it, um, kind of each one. But one is the hybrid restorative hygienist. So that's where you're seeing your hygiene schedule traditional hygiene schedule and then jumping over and doing restorations real quick to help the doctor out whenever you have downtime yeah. and then there's someone um who is an all-dayer who has um a restorative hygiene 
a restorative column right next to doctor's column and they're responsible i guess for not just whatever comes through the door i mean it's not like they have their column of um straight fillings because we can't prep so we're still dependent on the doctor so we still can kind of bounce back and forth and i guess that's probably what we know mostly oh, yeah. yeah we do both yeah oh yeah i would say and and i would even add in depends on where you work too so uh in the first place that i worked we would actually a doctor would actually have two columns it was it was in pediatrics but the doctor would have two columns of like child profies and three columns of restorative work and so we would end up working three columns of restorative work we had an assigned assistant to each column Mm -hmm. and then they'd work with the hygienist and the doctor to get all of that done Mm -hmm. um and so that can become uh, very fast paced mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh, very quickly. <laughs> um, yeah. But more the, the more the schedule that I work now is more. I pair up with a doctor uh, now. Now I do five hours in the morning, five hours in the afternoon. I pair up with a doctor, and basically they just have two columns of op work, and it does, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's like uh, even if it's a crown prep, then I'll go in and put in the um, the build up for that crown prep. Um, awesome. And so they can even work in some of that type of stuff, or uh, you know they can even do an endo and still put fillings next to the same on the same schedule. Mm-hmm. And in that endo, they'll come over and prep on whatever, and then I'll place the final restoration on the, after that endo is done. And so it it works. You just got to find out what works back and forth. Talk about make a money maker. <clears throat> I'm just thinking it, about the time you save. <laughs> right, and that and that's the thing. It's, it really is a time saver if you look at it. Um, even the, the local anesthesia argument that people have all the time is like, well, if we can just know of our own patients to do scaling and replanning, how much time would that save for the doctor and for the patient and for us? Now think about it restoratively. You're cutting out so much of their time. They can actually see more patients yeah. exactly. throughout the day. Yeah. It's, it's, oh my gosh, wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. On, for me, I like it more. Like Mike mentioned this a little bit earlier too about, you know, it's, it's fast paced. And so the time goes by a lot faster. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I don't want to say it's easier work, but it is kind of easier work. It's not hunched over the same patient for however long we're doing mm-hmm. our procedure. It is you go in and get them numb. You walk out, go get the next patient numb. Doctors are done prepping. Now you go back and put a filling in. Then you can go put a filling in somewhere else. And you're moving, walking up and down halls, you're, you know, different body positions and stuff all the time. And so it's, um, to me, it's more enjoyable work. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, and I don't mind jumping over and helping the doctor if I have some downtime. Yeah. Um, I, uh, so you my, have a dedicated assistant. Yeah. Oh, and that's another thing, too, is, yeah, we always have a dedicated yeah, because assistant I'm, I was for just having, us. If you didn't have one, can you imagine having to clean up all the rooms? Yeah, that would oh, be tough. And working five days a week? So I think the best model was the one that Mike mentioned because, yeah, you can't do all of that. You can't do all of that. But if you have an assistant dedicated to every column that's on, that's there or Mm -hmm. every room or however you want to look at it. But assistants, like in my opinion, I loved it when the assistants actually run the schedule and said, Andrew, just come here, come fill here, come anesthetic here, whatever. I mean, I like to be able to kind of pick what treatment we're doing. If it's not already treatment plan, like we're doing left side, right side. Like specifically, I was thinking back to where Mike and I first started because the doctors would diagnose and they, hey, when they need all eight of these fillings done, mm-hmm. and then we would see all three charts and we say, okay, assistant in room one, we're doing this one. Assistant in room two, we're going to do these four. Uh, room three, we're going to do this one. And also depending on like when they showed up and where they lay, where they whatever. But having the assistant there to really kind of pull us in whatever direction we need to be, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Just the best. I just oh, I love that model. Yeah, and well, even th- even silly things like sometimes you know a patient will come in and they have like one filling because they got you know on a distal pit somewhere because you know food got caught or you know, uh, a buckle pit because something didn't seal appropriately when they were growing up and it's just like why waste the time and bring them back right. as well and being when you have that restorative hygienist there. I mean, it's just, it's just a no-brainer. You know, you just bring them right over and you just do it. You already have the, – or, or the room's already set up. Just do it in the same room. You know, it just – it, all, it only need? takes – You need a hand piece and a couple instruments, and you can right. knock out that filling real quick, especially if it's a small one. Right. And I feel like that ability, though, also helps people with just their lifestyles because I feel like – some with disadvantaged backgrounds might have a harder time coming back for multiple appointments. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. if it's a matter of just seeing them, making the diagnosis, and then doing the treatment, and then they don't have to come back. Right. Helps with that makes more sense. And all sorts right. of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's, get, let's get rid of the diseases of people's mouths. Now, I understand that we were supposed to be prevention-based, and we still are a very prevention-based yeah. uh, hygienist, both Mike and I. 
But guess what? It's not eradicated yet. It's mm-hmm. still there. So in the meantime, while we're still working on prevention in our chairs for hygiene, let's continue to work with these people to give them great long lasting fillings Mm -hmm. um, through good technique Mm -hmm. uh, great contours um, keeping those margins sealed up and all that kind of stuff. Ooh, the way you're and talking, I may let, may let you place one on me. Right? <laughs> I like, I like how you're talking. Be the best one that you've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say, uh, maybe mics are better, but I don't know. Seal those margins. Well, yeah. I'm going to seal all, those that's margins what you for you. Even, I mean, I know, I know restorative dentistry isn't really preventative dentistry, but you know, you talk even some of the, the materials that we use. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if we're going to get into materials at all, but we talk about different materials that are like you know, the glass ionomers that really least fluoride over time that are going to help strengthen the teeth. We use, with hand. we use um, silver diamine fluoride hmm. uh, under the restorations, which again is a preventative um, thing. And so there's there are there is a little bit of prevention in it, but not as much as you know traditional hygiene. But when you hear glass ionomers, you normally hear that with sealant material. Um, that's what you hear well, that's the thing. on our side, like where we exactly, are as I say, on that's, the east that's coast. Regional. <laughs> that's a regional mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. So, so in the in the dental world, glass ionomers are not used for sealants, but in the hygiene world, traditionally, yes, you're right. Um, or in the art technique, the atraumatic restorative technique, the scoop and fill. Yes. That's another way that hygienists typically hear about glass ionomers. Well, that's what I teach. <laughs> but that's not what they're always for. Yeah, I mean, They can be used as permanent restorations as well. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of great companies out there that make a solid glass ionomer that can, that's really long-lasting. And we talked about it in one of our previous episodes with uh, DaVita. Um, you guys will probably hear that in a couple of weeks. But, um, well, you guys won't. You guys. You two that are interviewing us. <laughs> well, um, yeah, we talked a little bit about, like, the sandwich technique. Do you teach that? Mm-mm. Yeah. No. So, basically... Um, when you place a glass ionomer and then later on maybe you have to, you're going to put a uh, different type of material whether you, you know the patient wants an amalgam or a composite or whatever now that you have everything stabilized you can remove most of that glass ionomer leaving a little bit of a base a baser mm-hmm. a baser mm-hmm. and uh, for reimagination just and sensitivity relief and mm-hmm. you know whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and leaving that there and then you can just put your permanent restor- restoration on top of it so That's do called you the sandwich make that, technique. Do you, make that, do you make that a choice, or does the dentist make that choice on what type of restoration is placed? So, again, it goes back to your discussions with doctors. In our clinics right now, it's, it's taught to all the dentists how to do that particular technique. Um, I, I don't really know how to answer that question without sounding just dentists are going to hate us but i think a lot of times you just i i do make a lot of those decisions and but i always clear with my doctor first i say doctor um you know i have a class five right here because you never want to pick on their preps but mike and i've been doing this a long time that some docs don't know how to prep worth a crap Mm -hmm. and so they say yeah we want an amalgam class five i'm like well why did you make it the like a spoon (laughs) like where's the Mm -hmm. retention Mm -hmm. you know and so some of those ones were like well after I was placing this one, it just wasn't fit. It wasn't st- staying in. Um, is it okay if I use a glass ionomer? Uh, you know, yeah. you, you still have to clear it with the doctor. I mean, what do you? What do you think I agree, about? and and that, and that happens to me every once in a while. You know, it's not perfect, and you have to go back and say, "Hey, I've tried three times. I can't get the band oh, wow. in. I, I'm, <laughs> this isn't this isn't working. <laughs> you know, can I do this, or what would you suggest?" Mm-hmm. And kind of, it depends on how long you've been working with them. Um, they have to trust you, yeah, for sure, and, and to make that clinical respect, call, yeah, basically. Yeah. And when, is that like us feeling like, oh, that patient with all that stain, or who now has a toothache at the end of the exam? Like, it makes that time longer where you have to go back and grab them for a reprep. Is it like I one of those feel feelings? No. Do you feel that way? No. I'm like, oh. I'm like, I, it, it, sure, it's frustrating because you want to be the the hero, right? You right. always want to go in and just like, I got this, I'm awesome, I'm the best, you know, whatever. And then when it does take a little bit longer, I feel like the feeling I feel is, okay, yeah, that did suck, but now I have the opportunity <laughs> to give them something that they're really going to appreciate. Mm-hmm. And I have a conversation with them and say, hey, this, exactly. this is exactly what happened, mm-hmm. and sorry, we're going we're to change it up on you a little bit. This And this is why. Don't give them a long dissertation about you know, bonding strength and all that crap. No one cares about that. Mm-hmm. But, um, well, and I think they appreciate it when you involve them in the thing, you know, doctor did mm-hmm. say we were going to do a silver filling looking at it. It's probably not really going to work. And so here's why we'd want to do this. And they're like, Oh yeah, sounds great. Let's do it. And yeah. just being able to open with them. They, they take whatever 
you know, that we, we explain to them. So it's all about, well, it's like everything else in life. It's, it's confidence level. If you speak with authority sure. and confidence and if you speak with a little bit of education, cause we are educated. I mean, yeah, we did two years of nothing but restorative, mm-hmm. you know, in that time, like we know what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I even had a doctor in my last office and she would even tell the patients, yeah, Mike's going to come over and he's going to carve out this am- amalgam. And she's like, I think I need to take a, how to, uh, how to carve an uh, amalgam anatomy class from him because his, his things are just so beautiful. And it's mm-hmm. nice when you have that trust nice. level. And then when you can share that to the patient, it's really important too, you know, like, and I would do the same thing. Oh, oh you know, you haven't met the doctor yet. She is so awesome. You are going to love her. And when you can build that rapport with the patient, then it's easier for them to accept treatment mm-hmm. or understand, you know, if something does kind of go over. I, you know, it, they're just like, oh yeah, we trust you guys. You, you guys, it was lo- like, you guys oh, it was love a each other. And they screwed it over. Yeah. It wasn't. It was not like that. It's like, oh, there's a hygienist, and they are the better one to do this, and we're, they're going to make sure that it gets fixed if something went wrong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like we trust them implicitly because the doctor just put their stamp on us. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Awesome. Cool. I was curious as you were talking um, because I have heard. Uh, some people either read it or I heard it where they say um, hygienists having these restorative capabilities in other states so I guess that would be more of an advanced dental hygiene practitioner we see it from the from the point of view of bringing more access to care but I hear this conspiracy that oh that's just the corporate dentistry companies you know wanting to have more Ability to like get cheaper labor, basically, um, mm-hmm. and produce more. Mm-hmm. What do you have? You guys felt any of that? Heard any of that? Or have any thoughts behind that? I want to hear Mike's thoughts first. I have tons of <laughs> thoughts about that, but we'll hear Mike um, think about that. No, I'm going to let you start, and then I'll just kind of <laughs> jump in. That might be a whole okay. other episode. <laughs> so, being a business major as I am, it's all about economics. Sure. sure. Why not? I would absolutely like, even as a restorative hygienist. We free up the doctors to be able to do higher producing things that are outside of our scope, crowns, bridges, endo, um, whatever they want to do, partial, you know, all sorts of really top dollar things. Um, we have our traditional hygienists still doing really meaningful work of prevention and things like that. And then they have us, which is almost like a mid-level provider already, mm-hmm. placing fillings. And the, the purpose of that is to free up the doctor to do things that someone else could be doing. Right. I have my assistants do whatever they, they can in their scope, too. I absolutely enable them to do it because why not? It makes us everyone more efficient. So as far as the conspiracy, do I think that... You know, corporates paying ADHA lots of money to get this. Thing. Right. No, I don't think that's, that's really a conspiracy. But okay. is it true? Then yeah, absolutely. That's exact. That is the whole purpose. It's sure. not access to care. No one gives a crap about that. Sorry, hygienists do. We do. Right. But the people that are in charge don't care. Dentistry is a business. And dentistry is a thousand percent a business. That's all. That's all we're here for. Yeah. I mean, and you think about the dental model. The dental model is wait till someone gets hurt or sick or diseased, then we're going to fix it. Mm-hmm. And that's the dentistry. That's the that's the dentist model. Mm-hmm. And they were they were around before hygienists were. Mm-hmm. And so hygienists are now saying, hey, let's start prevention, prevention. And yeah, there's Cambra and some of those other things out there that, mm-hmm. that dentists are starting to move towards mm-hmm. because they're. It's like, oh, yeah, light bulb's going on. Like, hey, let's start getting some people healthy because now that there's a systemic link that's causative, not, you know, correlative, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I can see, but I can see how there is conservative. But yeah, it's all about the money. It's yeah. all about the money. Yeah. And sure. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, my own self. And we're kind of trained in school to not even focus on that aspect. Right. You know, we just focus on, okay, th- this is our ad pie, ad pie, ad pie, dental hygiene process of care. We want to give these preventative work and blah, blah, blah. But then when we get out into the real world, we're like, oh, my gosh. We don't understand that business aspect. Right. Yeah. Things. And that's what yeah. that adds to that frustration that you see in so many of those hygienists that are in the forums. Mm-hmm. When I think, like you said, sometimes they can even get a bad rap. Like I can tell you, um, the like the first job that I worked in was it wasn't necessarily like a corporation, but they kind of owned a, a major portion of the area. Um, it's corporate. It, that's that's a cor- it was a corporate structure, and they had lots of locations. Yeah, and but it wasn't DSO, which is a whole different model. Right, and there was a lot of you know not a negative marks about even going as oh you go you guys want to associate with them and then we learned that actually you know there was a lot of benefit for the hygienist as a as a practitioner in it uh, and we're and then i went to private practice and now i'm back uh with corporate again 
and uh, um, this one this one doesn't necessarily care about production per se. It's more about you know the prevention mm-hmm. and everything. So it kind of depends on the you know the CEO, I guess, and what they're how how they want you to practice, you know, mm-hmm. or what their what their business model is. And mm-hmm. so, um, so yeah. it kind of depends on where you work too. Yeah. I mean, but I, I want to be very clear, like. Um, I, I know I always stick my foot in my mouth, but I don't feel like it is the association's responsibility to create this for corporate dentistry. I think that if corporate dentistry wants this to be done, they should be outright and say, this is what we want. Right. Like, we're going to fund the legal battles and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like that's, that's where that battle needs to happen. I think sure. that, you know, our association is meant for us, not right. for a mid-level provider. The mid-level providers can have their own once that becomes kind of a bigger thing. Um, we will support mm, them, and we interesting. will. Do you not agree? Mm, uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Were you expecting a different answer? No. Now, now, now the real podcast begins. <laughs> <laughs> Forty-five minutes in. Come on. No, I, I just, I, it's not. It, that's a whole different model. It's a whole different. It is, thing. but when you look at the mission of our association, is to advance our profession. Mm-hmm. And and a dental therapist is still a dental hygienist. And if our model in some is, models, in some models it's not. In some models it's completely different. So what is that like? A like what? In spe- what specifically? So okay, so restorative hygienist. We'll take that is on the cusp of almost not really being a hygienist. So all we do is put fillings in. No we cleanings, no profies, no scaling. Exactly. So if, if my mo- if my model was like the other one we talked about where all I'm doing is just placing fillings all day long, how am I really a hygienist at that point? I don't think that's even listed. Like, okay, so now I'm going back to myself as an educator <laughs> right now. Sure. Okay? We have these certain things that are listed because I teach public health, mm-hmm. and these are the type of careers that are, that are options in, in dentistry. Restorative mm-hmm. hygiene isn't one. So you described your typical day, including preventative and restorative. That's what I do now, correct. And that's typically how... That's one model, though. That's one model. So there are hygienists out there that are just doing all restorative. Like Mike and I did for... How long did you do it? Four years? Know, five six years, years? Six years. And, and I so, did that for about four years. So essentially what we have outlined to our students is, is old or just not current. Or does not necessarily because associate with your state of where they're practicing? No, yeah. I'm using a book that's a national book. And so this um, book is <laughs> this book is was created by someone that's on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. Okay? And so there's no there's no textbooks for those in school that say, Okay, only West Coast, only Washington can can use this. And only, you know, right, right, right. okay, so my, that's very interesting that you bring that out. Now that I'm, I'm actually considering what you're saying and d- um, you describing that, it does kind of make sense to have it separate. But for me, coming from my mind frame as an educator and what we are teaching, mm-hmm. based on those that are accepted by, by CODA, as far as their standards, um, it shows that den- dental hygiene is more of a unified profession, not one that we should start separating. And I agree. That's what, no, that's what I'm saying. So I don't know if I, that makes sense. No, it does. It actually makes a lot of sense. But I feel like when you're talking about progress and that being the main mission of getting our – advancing the profession – you're not wrong in saying that that maybe eventually that could come. But when we have states like Texas and Georgia and all those people, and then the Washingtons, the Oregons, the other states that are doing way beyond that, I would really like to see that be the mission of the profession, uplifting those people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, 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 fr- I'm really, really frustrated. Um, by how behind we are. I think we all are. And we're not I'm, really I'm, all I'm that unified. Sickened. I'm oh, actually are sickened you, by even, it right now. Hear it. I mean. Even in the advanced areas like Washington, we're kind of sick of not being more advanced. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just, it's just, it's. But let's it's, talk about what the advancement could look like, though. The advance within the profession is getting the care to everybody. It's not advancing the scope of practice, it is advancing the care to the whole nation. 
that's as a hygienist that's that's our model that's what we want yeah um and yeah i did say earlier like that's not as enjoyable for me because you know what that's not that's not maybe it's not my passion but community health public health yes all of those things are areas of that we could advance into mm-hmm. collaborative stuff with medical places mm-hmm. i mean there's a lot of places a lot of tons of room for advancement that is not the advanced dental therapist now, at the same time, I'm not trying to, to bash. I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of the people that are pioneers and are, are moving things forward. Mm-hmm. I'm appreciative of the people who have decided to make that even a thing. Mm-hmm. Because I think that you know there's a lot of room for me to possibly move into that same career. But it's not the same career as what you have, Jasmine. It's mm-hmm. not. like Once I get to that, I will see myself as a mid-level provider. I don't know that I'll see myself as a hygienist anymore. Will I have the hygiene background? Absolutely. Will I still teach prevention? Absolutely. But don't our dentists teach prevention? Mm-hmm. So why aren't, why aren't they mm-hmm. technically hygienists then? Mm-hmm. They're not. They're dentists. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, it's, there's a, a clear educational difference. There's a clear legal um, licensure difference. I mean, there's tons of differences that puts them outside of dental hygiene. I think we just need a whole new name altogether <laughs> that fits everything. I think so. Yeah. We but need to that's, redefine you know, when it. When people say dental therapist, but, right. that makes a lot more sense to me sure. than advanced dental hygiene therapist or you know, like whatever the D have. Right. Know, dental dental okay. practitioner is another one, ADHP. Yeah. So I mean, I, I'm sorry to frustrate guys, everybody. No, I know no, my listeners because, are probably pissy at me too. I'm sorry, everyone. But. No, <laughs> I think it's actually a good conversation. And I was just thinking as you were talking, I'm like, wow, this is why I love podcasts. Yes. This is why I love podcasts because I heard a little bit about what you've done and um, I have worked as a dental assistant. Um, I was trained first as a dental assistant. Um, but it's just I'm actually annoyed. You know, I mean, there's so much to look forward to. I'm all yeah. about think beyond the profi, think beyond the profi, yeah. you know, career excellence. And I'm like, man, we're really in bad shape. But there, there, yeah, yeah, but there's so many you things know? that we can do. There's so many apps. Dentistry is beautiful. I love it so much. There's so many things that we are able to do as hygienists. And you're right, thinking beyond the profi is a big portion of it. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of avenues there, too. Mm-hmm. Um, what I, I think, I guess, as we're closing up, I think one of my last messages, I just wanted to say, I don't want people to misunderstand. Um, prevention always comes first. Yes. Prevention is d- near and dear to my heart. You guys know I do mission trips and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I, I love people mm-hmm. um, and getting them healthy. I think that's my number one objective. And mm-hmm. I don't really, I, I'm not happy that I have to do so much restorative work, uh, but I am at the same time very grateful that I have the opportunity to have the education and the licensure behind being able to do those things. Mm-hmm. I have a new side thought that we can continue later. Yeah, that's so up. what about we have regular dental, dental hygienists in medical offices and only dental therapists and dental offices? So while that's a great idea, the only obstacle you'll feel or you'll get from that is the dentists are going to say, I need the revenue from sure. my hygiene. Sure. Who's going to do checkups on the hygiene patients? They're going to be losing money, but for that, then they're going to start hiring some of those away at a lower wage or at a higher wage or whatever. I mean, it's going to be like I know. There's it's a, a mess. It's I a know. mess, but it's you're on the right track of having the ability to either separate or everyone come together. Right. Medical, dental in one air, one spot. Right. And um, I know we have several friends. I think you know Daniel Lopez has this board. Medical and dental are, are integrated, and getting them the real care that they need. Not, um, not separating it out so much. But mm-hmm. oh, yeah, right. That is some. That's a whole other tangent we can go on. Do you have any last yeah. thoughts? Sorry, Mike. I monopolize that, the that, mic. Yeah, that's what I'm, well, that's what I'm supposed to say. And Chrissy, oh, sorry. would you like to add anything else? <laughs> I thought we were taking over. <laughs> I know. This is supposed to be the mom. The mom take takeover. Andrew takes it back. We take it back. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going over. It's a really mic. good game of ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> this is, Mike's neck is hurting. I don't think you can right. handle us, Andrew. I don't think so. Either. We got you, Andrew. <laughs> Get like double team, like I just, one here. I won the devi- I won the designs for Vision Loops downstairs. Oh, you did. So yeah. Good for you. Oh, you need to collect that. Like I know. Soon. So yeah, come yeah, on. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, any closing remarks? No. Any closing remarks? Not really for me. I just thanks for having me on. I love restorative dentistry. I just I love dentistry in general, and I think 
the biggest thing for me is just making sure that uh, everybody has really, really good communication and mm -hmm. you know, that you're working towards the same goal. And if you're doing that, things will be smooth. It doesn't matter if you're doing restorative hygiene, traditional hygiene, you know, uh, any of that stuff. It, it just You just need to really work well with your team. And if you do that, then life's great. Just hearing you guys, I mean, although I, I am not content with where we are right now in dental hygiene, I feel like there's so much that we can look forward to in the future. I agree. You know, eventually when we get there. Absolutely. Yeah. There so thank you so much for giving us this opportunity and this platform to take over the a tale of two hygienists who we love. I love them. We started <laughs> off as fans. We were, well, I was interviewed last year. Uh -huh. Now we've taken over. What else? And we'll be back. Okay, because that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I, love I love it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Mike and I had a great time doing it. Special thanks to Jasmine and Christy again for interviewing us and, and kind of taking over the, the podcast. Um, we have Voices of Dentistry coming up, voicesofdentistry.com. Um, it is a conference for everyone, not just podcasters, but you will meet some of your favorite podcast hosts and guests there. And if you want to be a, maybe a guest on one of your favorite dental podcasts, this is going to be held in Scottsdale at the end of January. Michelle and I are going to be there and we're going to be speaking. We have a really awesome lecture planned on teledentistry and I don't want to spill the beans too much, I guess. I don't want to jinx us because I, we think we have it all planned out, but you know, weird things happen. So everyone cross your fingers that it turns out the way we want it to t turn out, but it'll be a great opportunity for us to collaborate with some of the dentists that'll be on site. There'll be probably hundreds of dentists on site and talk more about teledentistry and how it can actually be utilized in a real functional way and become part of our everyday lives. Thanks again, everyone. We really appreciate your support. Have a great week. have like 18 hours on this SD card, so we should be good. We should be good for this one episode. It's not gonna... No promises. <laughs> oh, I hate not hearing myself. Can I wear um, the thing? You can do whatever your heart is Why do you want to listen to yourself? I don't I just like listening. You're so weird. You, you, you never, you never, never listen? I never what? listen to it. I watch this, the monitors. Oh, I listen, I listen. Is that okay? Yeah, it's whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, this is basically your hosting this podcast. Okay, so what, how, what do you want me to do as an um, introduction? Um, I'm hey, subbing in for Tale of Two Hygienists. We're when I'm hijacking. Special bonus episode. <laughs> we're hijacking their the podcast. Mom, Janice, hijacking. Just oh. go line out, right? No, right here. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, you want me to say... How's it going? <laughs> you are so not right. <laughs> you are, were you waiting for it to be in the red? Okay, yeah, so was. you can bust my ears. <laughs> trying, trying for it. All right, so um, you wanted to be a mom genus takeover? Yeah, of, all right, all right, I've got, I've got a good one. Okay. <laughs> She's a natural. Mike, Watch her, boys. Some words. <laughs> was that enough? Yo, yo, yo. No. Check one, two. I think it's yeah. on. It is on. I know. I turned it on. Just right. drop some right. beats. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to quit my you day job. You guys are like Michelle. You guys are all over the place. <laughs> I know. You guys are, you guys are here, and all of a sudden you're up here, and then... <laughs> Oh, with the, oh. And then you were up here again. I'm like, what is going on? I don't on? even look at all that. I mean, that's pretty much <laughs> female, right? Well, if you get in this little red area, then that's bad. I know, yeah. So I look at the red. If it's not red, I'm good. Oh, 
Okay. But All I'm right. just like, I just press record. What makes somebody in the red? Like the volume? They're in debt. <laughs> right? Yeah. But uh-huh. I think she was referring to the Oh, the if, you, if you're yeah. yelling too loud. If you're yelling. So we got to be real chill. Like What Andrew. about if you're pitchy? I don't think we'll have to worry about that here. Okay. 